I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about the process of figuring out what you wanted to put in there and, and how you gathered those materials. I mean, obviously, uh, we were blessed with a lot of, of footage of, of Charles and his various groups over the years, a lot of photos. Obviously, there's a process of determining what to put in and what not. I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. I started carrying a video camera uh, when they would go on tours in the early 90s, and I just liked this big bulky thing, and it was tape. But I would video concerts and then backstage or meeting with friends. And I made my first foray into film, creating a documentary in the mid-90s, and I, it was an hour, and it was called Memphis is in Egypt. There was a, a filmmaker who did a, a film about Charles in the 60s called Journey Within, and that was a black and white film that followed Charles around um, Eastern Europe and the, the um, Soviet bloc countries and in some of the uh, Fillmore concerts here in the U.S. So I, I used footage from that, but he also went back to Charles Roots in Memphis. So for this film, I didn't want to go so much into the areas of childhood, but actually give more of a picture on the second half of, of Charles' life. I then began to research archival material from the 60s. Some of that was quite difficult to get permission to use. And then there were a number of very great still photographers who provided me with photos from different eras and, and gave me permission to use them. We start painting the picture and putting the elements together and tying all them. Was there anything that you wanted to get to put into the film that you were unable to get? I think I got pretty much everything. There may have been some things I discovered after the film was completed, but the most difficult piece was a segment of about three and a half minutes that was shot in Antibes, France in 1966. And the director of that was a well-known French director who is now in his 90s, probably 95 now. And, and no one had ever seen that because he's such a difficult man to work with. To get permission was near to impossible, and then he didn't want anybody to cut down what he had shot, which was the entire concert. However, there were vast gaps in sound. There would be 10 minutes of film, but no sound. I had to convince him that, one, if Charles deemed it okay to edit the music down, it should be all right. And two, how could he expect anybody not to cut it if there was no sound? So ultimately I ended up with three and a half minutes of, of his film, but it was very difficult, but I'm, I'm, I'm extremely glad that it's in there. I'm glad you negotiated that the right way. There was an interesting comment there toward the end, I don't know if it was from Jason Moran or, or from Eric Harland or another member of your current band, talking about how People all the time want to talk about Forest Flower, and he's saying, have you heard this current group? And as I was paging through the, the new issue of Downbeat, where you probably don't care about these rankings, but you're listed number four on the critics' poll as artist, number four as a group, number two on tenor, people are obviously paying attention to the new work and, and talking a lot about Wild Man Dance, and I would think that that would have to be rewarding as well. I mean, do, do you feel that, that people are, are paying attention to and appreciating your new music as much as some of those classics? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I went to journalism school, they warned me about asking yes or no questions. <laughs> so I will say, could you elaborate? <laughs> Last night of the play, they made poor applause. You know, we don't, um, I don't live in there. It's great to have acknowledgement, but we live in a rigged game, all of us, whether we know it or not, and then uh, we're passing through here. And then on a higher level, I'm in service, and to be a music maker has always moved me more than uh, the marketplace. It's wonderful to be appreciated. Of course, everyone feels that in their lives, but you also have to realize that there are these peaks and valleys and there are these droughts. You have to be prepared to go forward over the long run 
And as I said, in the end, they may bore a blog. You just have to sing your song. And we stood on the shoulders of those great masters who went before us. You know, we have to, in our lifetime, sing the song also. So I don't, I don't agree with those. I, I like cooperation. As a group, when we play, we help each other. We're in the now, and we're listening, and we're helping each other to get to the other shore. And always before I play, there's a situation of, like, nerves or something. And I don't know that I could do this. And then once I get started, it's like we get met and the chasm is not there. And a few breaths later, Dorothy's trying to get me off the stage. So I don't know anything about any of this stuff you're talking about. Uh, I'm just glad I didn't let you stop the gas. In the film, you can tell that obviously you have found and nurtured many, many young, talented artists. I mean, just the list of pianists that you've played with alone is a who's who of, of uh, the downbeat pole and everything else. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that process of identifying and finding younger players to play with. And you, you talked a little bit about standing on the shoulders of giants and, and kind of paying it forward. What that process was like for you as a young player and then being able to do that to some of the young players that you play with in terms of nurturing and helping them with their uh, careers. When I was nine years old, I played on an amateur show in Memphis, which is where I was born. And it was the Palace Theater on Beale Street. And I won first prize and standing ovation. There was one lady who stood up in here to, tonight and then I realized it was one of Dorothy's lifelong friends, so <laughs> that was probably a setup, you know. But thank you anyway, Joy. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand the world, you know. I, I'm, I'm drunk with music and I go like that. But so I win this first prize and uh, I walk into the wings of the theater and uh, in my hometown there was a genius of a pianist, Phineas Newborn. You probably never heard of him. He, uh, he was on the level of J.S. Bach and R. Tatum and these kind of people. And, and uh, truly, he was, he was the real master. And so I walked into the wings, and he was about 16. But he was a genius in our town. I didn't know him at the time I was nine. So I didn't have much exposure. He said to me, you need lessons bad. <laughs> and mind you, I just won first prize, you know, and I had a standing ovation, you know. And it reminds me of some of these rock and roll bands I, I've known. They got rich before they learned how to play, you know. And so somehow I didn't get up, I didn't, uh, the order of it, I got messed up. But uh, what, what was interesting is that. He took me by the hand, he took me around the corner off Beale Street to a hotel called Mitchell's Hotel where all the musicians lived and played and like that. It was a hotbed of, or a cauldron of uh, modernity and everything. And that river was a few blocks up the road, you know. And he knocked on this guy's door, Irving Reason, a great alto player, and Irving opened the door. Irving was very Suave, he looked like, uh, you don't remember all the actors, but Zachary Scott, he was very, you know, well put together. And Phineas said, this guy needs help, and he left me, and Phineas left. <laughs> and in my nine-year-old mind, I said, this is deep, because I didn't get to have illusions of grandeur yet, you know, I just, <laughs> I just won this thing and nobody is uh, paying attention to that and, <laughs> and now I'm brought to my knees. So my whole process in life is that uh, the Creator was very kind to me and, and uh, having that rough rebuke in the beginning because it's made me to always uh, want to go forward and to be uh, better at what I do. And uh, I think it's a great thing to not get the cart before the horse, you know. So I practiced and studied all my life. But you asked me the question about the pianist. This guy, Phineas Newborn, was the genesis of all of that. And 
I'd go over to his house, I'd ride my bicycle over and I'd sit out on the lawn and listen to him and kind of have goosebumps and shiver and roll around and stuff, you know. And a lot of things that happened with that. And then a few years later he came and got me and put me in his father's band with him and his brother Calvin. So that was very um, sacred and blessed. You didn't ask this question, but that was really interesting. This guy Elvis Presley used to come and hear us every night. We played in some little club across the river called Plantation Inn. Mississippi and Tennessee, Mississippi and Arkansas, there's a little corner where they meet there and there's this river. We'd go across the river every night and play these roadhouses on the highway over there. And uh, what Elvis was doing, he wasn't trying to learn the guitar properly like Calvin. He would never be able to do that in a thousand years. But what he was interested in was how Calvin moved his legs and stuff when he played. <laughs> so he did take that to the bank, you know. <laughs> and many years later, uh, in the area where we live when we're not touring, I always thought it was strange that Elvis would take another man's music, a black man's music, and take it to the world. Because Chuck Berry and, and who's that, little Richard and these people. So what the guys who created that music that Elvis took around the world, they, they never were permitted to unleash that on the public. And, but when Elvis came along, they said, okay, finally, now we can promote this, you know, because we've got the hero to do it with. And I always thought it was strange, and I often wondered how he felt about all of this. I know I'm off course for what we're doing here, it's You're another fine. film. So this guy that I know, who's a friend, he had a birthday party for he and his wife. He, it was the 100th birthday party for both, for both of them. Oh, don't tell that part. <laughs> well, she said I'm going into too much minutia detail, but I think it's interesting. <laughs> this guy, this guy turned 60 and his wife turned 40, so that was their 100th birthday. <laughs> See, they appreciate it. And so then, she said, my wife's my best friend, she's my best lover, she, and, a, and a buddy of his said, Jerry, Jerry, she's your only lover. <laughs> So things like that were going on. Anyway, at this party, uh, Barbara Streisand was there. A lot of Hollywood people were there, too. And uh, I played tennis with this guy. And Priscilla Presley was there. And so I went over to her and I said, may I speak with you? And she looked me up and down. She said, this guy is hitting on me. And she gave me the look like, okay, I'm going to go for it. You know, and she said, yes. So, but... I had a different mission, you know. I said, this guy you were married to, he, uh, how did he feel about it? I said, I said, I'm from Memphis. And she, she thought that was strange, you know. She, she didn't see me in that picture of being from Memphis and all of that. Anyway, she said that he felt very inadequate in what he used to do he would go around to the black churches on Sunday and put wads of $100 bills in uh, offerings. And it kind of unarmed me. It was very tender and touching that she said that. And uh, I'm sure no one outside of this room ever knew that. And so life's interesting, you know. Uh, but he, see, his position in life was those guys who created this music. He worshipped them, you know, and he would love to have been that. But his station was such that they gave him the whole thing, you know. He could only go out at night. They would open theaters for him at night after everything was closed down, and he and his boys would go, and they would go play softball and stuff. They would turn the lights on for them at 4 o'clock in the morning and stuff, you know, when everybody's gone to sleep, you know. So he had to live another hours. Anyway, Dorothy wants me to get off it. I will. Why don't you talk to Dorothy? This is not my show. I won't answer any more questions. Please speak with Dorothy only. Oh, guys, I have a film you can do now based on the past two years, or three years since you've been in this film. What would you do with that? This was like a, a classroom question. It was a challenge. There's a whole other film that could be 
created on the uh, friendship and musical relationship between Charles and Maria Farturi, the Greek singer. And there's another relationship with a Brazilian singer, Gilberto Gil. And, and in the longer version of the film, I had sections with both of them in it, but it didn't serve a big enough picture to include it, and so I excluded it. So if I had, I would need more than 10 or 15 minutes to add on. But um, those would be areas that I would need to address. Do you think we might see another film at some point? Probably would. What was his reaction? I think he was deeply moved by it. Tears is what happened to me. Very, very early on. Who nurtured you? At nine, you were playing. Nine, you won an award. But before nine, who bought you your first saxophone? Who nurtured you up until that point? I assume you always felt it. But somebody had to listen and support you very early on. Who was that? How did that happen? My mom was on it, yeah. Yeah, I have great advice. <laughs> when I was a kid in Memphis, Duke Ellington's orchestra used to come through. My mother had a large house, and they would room with us because there weren't hotels that would accept them. They were of quality, and, and so they, they had the rooming house kind of thing going on. And Johnny Hodges and the guys who played with Duke Ellington, the greatest saxophonist probably ever, Johnny Hodges, one of, one of them for sure. Uh, my mother would go backstage and she said, he wants to play the saxophone. Was, I was about six or seven. Uh, how, how, what's your age? Oh, you, you far along. <laughs> anyway, I was about six or seven and she would say that he wants to play the saxophone. And those guys would say, please make him be a doctor, lawyer, or Indian chief. Not, <laughs> not this stuff because it's too hard. But I was bit by the cobra, so I had no, no alternative but to do it. But I will say to you, uh, if you do it, do it because you love it, and uh, it will love you back.